Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this video, we're going to be discussing hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Both of these concepts are very important, especially for your basic understanding of medicine and pathology. So it's very important you spend the time to understand these concepts. As always, we're going to be posting brand new videos every single day to help you prepare for your examinations and for your boards. So don't forget to subscribe to our channel because your support really means a lot to us. So with that being said, let's discuss hypertrophy and hyperplasia by first discussing cellular adaptations. This is very important because this is going to set up our baseline understanding for the concepts we're going to be discussing in this lecture. So what do you need to know about cellular adaptations? Well, you need to know that first and foremost that our cells are constantly under a lot of stress because of the environment that they are in. Now you might be confused about what I mean, so let me give you an example. The example I have is the stomach lining. The cells that make up our stomach lining are constantly being exposed to what? To stomach acid, right? And what is stomach acid? Stomach acid is essentially hydrochloric acid and it is very corrosive. It will deteriorate and destroy the stomach lining. Now in order for our cells to survive in that stressful environment, we have developed cellular adaptation, which we'll discuss in subsequent lectures, but this is the basic understanding you need to have. Now, what we're in, when we're talking about cellular adaptations at the microscopic level, our cells are constantly dying and adapting, but when we're talking about it at the macroscopic level, i.e. in terms of our organs, we need to understand that our organs are generally in a state of homeostasis. So although they're constantly being exposed to small micro environments of very stressful situations overall our organs are in a state of homeostasis now eventually you're going to have some sort of stress being placed upon our organ whether it's the heart whether it's the kidneys etc etc and those organs are going to adapt in order to continue their function now the change that's going to happen in these organs is going to be based off of the type and the severity of the stress and that's very important to remember of the type of stress that's being placed upon them Different types of stresses are going to lead to different pathways. Now, that's very important to understand, which we'll come back to later on in this series. But you need to understand that the type and severity, especially the severity, I think this is uh, the more important of the two, the severity and the type are going to uh, change our organs in certain ways. Now, an increase in stress, regardless of the type of severity, is essentially going to lead to the growth of an organ. The organ is going to grow. It's either going to go through hyperplasia or hypertrophy, which are the two main types of growth adaptations you should be familiar with. So with that being said, you should have a good and general understanding of the basic concepts of cellular adaptation. Let's start talking now about hypertrophy and hyperplasia. Both of these are very important. So we're going to write H-Y-A-F, high yield as F. And that's an acronym you should commit to your mind because this stuff is going to come up on your boards. This stuff is going to be tested in the wards and you're going to have to deal with these concepts day in, day out. So do not forget these concepts. So we're going to start talking now about hypertrophy. Hypertrophy is a type of growth adaptation that occurs due to an increase in the size of an of the cells of an organ. And that's very important to understand because this is one of the key differentiating factors between hypertrophy and hyperplasia. So hypertrophy just means that your cell is going to grow in size. Now, how does this actually happen? Another key important thing you need to remember is that hypertrophy involves gene activation to induce an increase in the protein synthesis and organelle production. Now, how are you going to remember this? Well, I always thought about this very logically, very straightforward. And a pro tip when it comes to medicine, think about medicine in a very logical manner. It's going to make it so much easier for you to digest and for you to understand what's going on. So if we're talking about this logically, when you have a small cell like you do right here. Well, during this stage, when the cell is small, you're going to have organelles, you're going to have protein production, protein synthesis happening, and the cell is going to be filled up. Eventually, you're going to put some stress on the cell, right? And that is going to essentially cause the cell to go through hypertrophy and the cell is going to grow in size. Well, even though the size is growing, if it didn't go through gene activation to increase protein synthesis and organelle production, the cell would only be filled up this much. 
That's it. The rest of this space right here would be empty. So how does our body go around fixing that? It's going to induce gene activation and protein synthesis to allow for organelle production to occur and for other uh, functions of the cell to go down and the cell to be able to handle that stress. So essentially, you're going to fill up all this space right here with additional organelles, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. That's how I remembered it. And then always stuck in my mind, because then it made sense that you don't have this much wasted space, it's being used. So very few organs are actually going to go through only hypertrophy, only. That's very important to remember. All four of these points I have listed on this slide are, you guessed it, high yield as F. You need to remember all of this because it is, these are very easy points. These are very easy gimme points and very easy to confuse someone on. So test, test writers like to test your basic knowledge on these concepts. So that is hypertrophy in a nutshell, okay? Now compare that to hyperplasia. We're going to see a completely different type of growth adaptation, even though the end goal is the same, which is to be able to handle the amount of stress being placed upon an organ. So hyperplasia is also a type of growth adaptation that occurs, however, via an increase in the number of cells. Remember, hypertrophy, and I'm going to write this on the side so you guys do not forget, hypertrophy actually goes down with an increase in the size of the cell, and it happens via gene activation, okay? Do not forget this. That is how hypertrophy is going down. Hyperplasia, and I'm going to write it on the other side, hyperplasia is an increase in the number of cells, okay, number of cells, and it goes down, it happens via production of new cells from stem cells, right? How else are you going to produce new cells? Well, you're going to need stem cells. Now, these are two main concepts you need to commit to your memory. I keep saying this over and over again, but it is the truth no matter what, no matter how many times I say it. So let's just give you another picture. If this is one cell right here, the only way you're going to grow the cell into multiple cells is by using the stem cells to increase the number of cells to essentially take over the same amount of space needed to handle the stress being placed upon this uh, organelle or on this system. Now, a normal example of hyperplasia does exist in the human body, and it happens in females in the uterine lining during the menstrual cycle. Now, this is very important. This is a normal, this is a physiologic example of hyperplasia. Okay, this happens because during hyperplasia, during the menstrual cycle, excuse me, the uterine lining actually grows. So it might be this, this is the uterine lining baseline. During the menstrual cycle, it's going to grow, and then when menses occurs, it's going to drop off. It's going to go through atrophy, which we'll talk about in a later lecture, and the uterine lining is going to die off, and that's when a female has their period. But this process right here is actually happening because of hyperplasia, because you have stem cells in your uterine lining in the basal layer, and that is allowing for the cells of the uterine lining to grow and to be able to hyper go through hyperplasia. That is a normal or a physiologic example. Okay, I'm gonna write this here. So you do not forget this. There are also pathologic examples of hyperplasia, and that's very important to remember because pathologic hyperplasia can lead to dysplasia and cancer. Now, this is a very important sequence of events that you need to remember. Keep it in the back of your mind because we're going to discuss it in depth later on, but pathologic hyperplasia, and I'm going to write it on the bottom right here so you guys do not forget. So, pathologic hyperplasia will eventually lead to dysplasia. And what is the difference? Well, dysplasia can be reversed, okay? And if left untreated, dysplasia, dysplasia can lead to cancer and many different types of cancer, which we'll discuss later. So there is an example of pathologic hyperplasia that I'm going to give you guys right now so you can understand what's going on. 
just so it is clear in your mind. And the example is endometrial hyperplasia that can lead to endometrial carcinoma. Usually this happens in postmenopausal females that are not going through the menstrual cycle anymore. They've gone through menopause and there's no reason for the endometrial lining, the uterine lining to grow with the menstrual cycle because they're not undergoing menses anymore. But if the procedure, if the process in their body is messed up, if it is not going through the proper channels, the proper pathways, you can get pathologic hyperplasia in which the endometrium is going to go through hyperplasia and if left unchecked, it'll eventually develop a very dangerous type of cancer called endometrial carcinoma. And that's why elderly or older females who have gone through menopause are constantly being told to go to the ob and get checked up regularly to get screened for these types of cancers to catch them early on. That's very important to remember. Now, an exception to this rule in males is benign prosthetic hyperplasia, aka BPH. BPH is very important because you're going to hear a lot about this in your medical school, in your school, in your board preparation, in your exams, and in real life. It's a very common, very, very prevalent condition that occurs in many, many men in which the prostate high goes to hyperplasia, grows in size, and leads to a plethora of symptoms, which we'll talk about in subsequent lectures. But the process in this condition is the same. The cells in the prostate are going through hyperplasia. They are growing. However, the key thing to remember in BPH, you have no, no association with BPH progressing to prosthetic cancer or prostate cancer. Okay, this does not happen. BPH is a very benign condition, hence why it is in its name, benign prosthetic hyperplasia. So keep that in mind. All three of these examples are also very important. So a normal example of hyperplasia would be the uterine lining. Another normal example of physiologic hyperplasia uh, will be, sorry, a, no, an example of pathologic hyperplasia will be endometrial hyperplasia that leads to endometrial carcinoma in postmenopausal females. And then a exception to the rule because there are always exceptions in medicine is going to be benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Now earlier I told you that there are two main types of growth adaptations, hypertrophy and hyperplasia, and I told you that these are conditions that we use in order to adapt to uh, stressful environments. Well the truth is a lot of times in our body, our body is going through both of these processes at the same time, especially when exposed to a stressful environment. So let's talk now about hypertrophy and hyperplasia hyperplasia that usually happens together. That's very important to understand because our body has the ability to adapt in multiple ways. And if we were only left with every single cell, every single type of cell being able to adapt with only one of the two ways, we would never survive right? And that's why we have these adaptive mechanisms in order to increase our chances of survival, increase our chances of our organs and our tissues surviving when placed under stressful situations. So usually both of these things are going to happen together. An example, an example of hypertrophy and hyperplasia happening together just happens to be the uterus once again, but this time it's going to be a little bit different. So during pregnancy, the uterine lining is going to undergo hypertrophy and hyperplasia at the same time because the uterus is going to increase in the size, right? The uterus grows and it's going to increase in the number of cells as well in order to accommodate for the fetus. This is again a physiologic response, not pathologic. Very important to understand, okay? So this is one example you should just keep in the back of your mind so you do not forget that majority of the time in our body, if not almost all the time, hypertrophy and hyperplasia are happening together. Now, this is an example. There is always an exception to the rule and we're gonna talk about that right now and it's gonna go back to our previous slide in hypertrophy when I said that only few organs are gonna uh, go only, are gonna undergo only hypertrophy. So. Very few organs are going to only undergo hypertrophy, and those organs are permanent 
tissues. Permanent tissues are very important to remember because, like I said, these organs can only undergo hypertrophy. This is very important to remember. And there are three main types of permanent tissues you need to remember. These are cardiac myocytes, these are skeletal muscles, and nerves. So we're going to talk about each of them right now. When you're talking about the cardiac myocytes, because we have no stem cells in these permanent tissues, our cardiac myocytes have no ability to undergo hyper hyperplasia. And that's very important to understand because hyperplasia, like I said earlier, is a process that needs stem cells, okay, whereas hypertrophy involves gene activation. So we can activate genes to cause our permanent tissue to grow in size, but not in number, okay? So we cannot grow in number. We can only grow in size. That is very important to understand, number one. Number two, if you're talking about our skeletal muscle, think about working out. When you work out, what happens? It's not that you grow more muscle. It's not that your muscle cells grow and, uh, and they duplicate. Your muscle cell is just gonna grow in size. And that's why you see all these uh, bodybuilders who have hypertrophied their muscles and have gotten big and swole. It's because they've worked out and they've undergone hypertrophy. And then finally, nerves. You already know this, but nerves cannot be replaced. And once they're damaged, they are pretty much damaged. And even though there are new updates and changes coming in science and medicine when it comes to nerve regeneration, especially after uh, a damage, the basic concept about the fact that nerves do not have stem cells still remains true. So nerves are also classified as uh, a type of permanent tissue. So what happens in these situations? Let's talk about cardiac myocytes. Let's talk about when your heart is placed under a lot of pressure and it has to accommodate, right? So when you have uncontrolled hypertension over a course of a year, you're going to get our cardiac myocytes uh, to grow in size and that's when you get a hypertrophied heart. So if you look right here, this is the heart tissue and it is significantly larger than the, uh, the left ventricle. So this is actually the left ventricle. This is, sorry, the right ventricle. Okay. And this right here is the left ventricle. The left ventricular wall has undergone hypertrophy. And that's why you call this left ventricular hypertrophy, whereas the right ventricle is so it's normal size. So this is an example of only one process going through, going down in permanent tissue. For example, in cardiac myocytes, you have left ventricular hypertrophy going down. Now, this is a basic overview of hypertrophy and hyperplasia. I hope this was helpful. If it was, don't forget to subscribe to our channel. We're going to be posting brand new content every single day to help you succeed and get through your medical education without going into more significant debt. If you guys like what we're doing, please consider supporting our channel because your support really means a lot to us. Have a wonderful day and we'll see you back here in the next episode or lecture, whatever.